for the 10 years that Scott Batici was involved with the Nottingham squad from 1978 to 1989, there was 35 people killed under his watch in one form or another. Even when he was, even when he was an informer, he'd have been the last person in the world you'd have thought was a was a British agent. But I am certain, and it's not as simple as that either. I'm quite certain that Freddie had a cast iron guarantee that no one in the in the Republican movement was going to touch him. Thanks. Um thanks very much for sitting down and joining me, but I, I appreciate it a lot. Um the the book for, for anyone who hasn't read the book, a uh, fantastic read. Uh, c- congrats on putting it together. Easy one of the best um kind of troubles related books I've ever read. And usually, especially uh-huh. now with like an American audience, now I I live over in America. Um, I usually if, if I was to recommend them a book, um, about like Northern Ireland or the Troubles, I always tell them to read, like like a broader history first, and then and then if it's a book about a specific thing like like agents like stake number or something, I, I I'd say to I'd say to to then read the specific one, but but for this one, th- this actually emerges the two it's by no means a history of the troubles but but it does give you a very good context um so so yeah th- th- this one actually would be a book I, i'd say you could read like standalone and um, w- were you happy with the with the way the book came out i was john um i don't think a reader a reader's ever totally happy with a book but i have to say i was happy with this being such a controversial subject, you have to ask yourself, was it worth the hassle? Because it is hassle. And I have to say, it was, I'm, I'm happy that I've done it. Um, I'm happy that I brought a bit of light to this subject because the whole Scapatici thing, people thought they knew it. And I don't I mean, and I brought some light to it and some clarity, but not, I mean, whether anyone knows the whole Scapatici story is another matter. I'm not too sure Scapatici knew the whole Scapatici story, if I were to be honest. Uh, there's that much intrigue and there's that much skullduggery going on in the background, especially with Brits with the Tuscan and Coordinating Groups, etc. You don't ever, and that's an umbrella group that ran all intelligence operations in the North. You never really get to the the, 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 the heart of it. You, you do to a point, and then they close shop. But I'm glad I wrote it. But fantastic, yeah. Um. Okay, so um, Scapucci, for for anyone who's read like um like biographies of like ex-IRA men and stuff, he has actually showed up in one or two. He was in he was he he showed up as an alias in Kevin Fulton's book. He he was uh, he was Michael in that book. He was also in. He was named in Killing Rage, uh, by by Eamon Collins. Um. Okay, but but your your research went way way beyond uh, quoting quoting a few books that he was in, and, and obviously there's a steak knife book written by um by Ingram and Harkin. But your your research went far far beyond that. C- can you talk to me a little about um about like pulling uh p- pulling the various sources of information because there's so there's such a wide ranging. Um, uh, sources that that this book is 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 sourced from, you know. Well, my my priority, my approach to this was to talk to people who actually knew him, people who grew up with them, and people who were about him in the IRA, and who knew about him in the IRA. To me, that was the crucial element, and I was fortunate in that I knew it was well. I'd introduced more than you. To, start, to people from the markets area who had grown up with them, who knew the type of person he was, free troubles. Um, and that was very helpful. And then I also spoke to guys who had been involved with them in the markets IRA. He lived in the markets area of Belfast, in the markets IRA unit. So that was helpful as well. I also spoke to um, former internees who had been interned with them. And I spoke to guys from various areas of the north who had dealings with him in his capacity as adjutant and OC of the Internal Security Unit, aka the Nuddling Squad. So I spoke to that 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 to me was the core the core sort of um 
group that I needed to sort of the stories I needed to get to, to get to take it. I had to take this story away from previous books and general analysis and people saying things. There's a rumor that and they said that I had to get away from that. I had to get people with real stories who knew them. And that to me was the crucial element. After that, there it was usually basic. Uh, uh, basic research that you do for any biography. Where did his parents come from? Where is his lineage? Where did his grandparents come from? What did they do for a living? What did he do for a living? Who was his, who was his wife? Uh, his children? What, what sort of relationship had he with his neighbours? All of that stuff. And then what did he do for a living? Why, what did he do in the IRA? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you build up the picture but the core, the core, the core of the book is the testimony of the IRA volunteers and his neighbours from the market area. I see. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so he, he uh, Scaptici was born um, in Belfast in 1946. And um, so, just by coincidence of of fate, like so many other men, he became. He kind of came of age when the troubles were were kind of heating up, and and then really began. For real, I think he, uh, yeah, he would have been like about kind of about kind of twenty five, and um, when they a little less when they when they kicked off properly. Um, your your own um your own joining of the IRA was around that time. Is, is there any sort of um? It, it's kind of interesting that the person who wrote the book has like a parallel, um, somewhat in, in terms of their joining and and their membership. You know, well, he was a lot older than me. I mean, when trouble started in sixty nine. I was 15, I was doing eight levels at school. And so I didn't, I, I came from a Republican background. My, my father and all, my father was in the IRA and so was all his brothers. So I came, I, I'd, been, I'd been sort of a, uh, brought up in a Republican environment. And when the troubles kicked off, we lived down the, the lower falls. There was whole streets burning 150 yards from us. There was mothers with kids running up the street for their lives, and there was there was widespread shooting, principally from loyalists and from cops. I mean, the the, the beach specials were the guys with the guns, and they didn't have any guns. They were doing all the shooting. That's why there was so many. It was four four Catholics shot dead, including the nine year old kid that night. So initially, I mean. Me gravitating towards the divisional IRA at 15, 16, I tried to get him when I was 16, and they wouldn't let me in. said I was too young. And I persisted, and eventually I got in, just turned 17, and I was, I, I, and I get in at 17. Scott Batici didn't go to the IRA right away. The provisionals didn't form until December 1970, and he joined them. He, and, they, and he joined the unit in the markets area. And it wasn't long before he rose to the position of OC. He's a very strong wee character. And he had a presence about him. You know, he had a, he had a presence about him and an arrogance about him. And those are the type of things that naturally stick out and, and make one appear to be a natural leader. So no time at all, he was OC. To cut a long story short, he was involved and operations in terms of fucking bombs in the center of Belfast, etc. And then in 19, in 19th August 1971, when internment came out, he was arrested on the first roundup. So that's basically his pre his pre internment sort of category. Um, and then he got out in 1984, March 84. And he was re interned in September 84. But in between times, he had been, he had done a stint as the Brigade OC at Belfast. That's the top man in Belfast in the whole brigade. So he'd, be, he'd been Brigade OC and he was re interned and he was released again in December when internment ended. He was there at the very start, he was there at the very end when internment ended in December uh, 1975. 
Um, f funny uh, in, in the book as well. I I didn't know this, but um, he actually could have been released a bit early from internment, but he refused to sign um a, a, a sign some documents saying saying that he would like like stay away from the IRA and stuff. It it, it actually. If if you were to look at him at that time, you would probably think he was quite unlikely to become um the pro probably the biggest the biggest rat in in, in their history, right? In Irish history, that would be absolutely you're absolutely right, John. All he had to do was to sign a document disavowing the IRA and and stating that he wouldn't go back, and he would have been released. And he didn't do it, and he could have done it. And it takes a strong person. To say, I can walk out that gate within the hour. All I have to do is just sign this bit of paper, right? And he wouldn't sign the paper. He said, you know what? Just keep me in. So you definitely would not have considered Billy Scott a teacher, even when he was, even when he was an informer. He'd have been the last person in the world you'd have thought was a was a British agent. But certainly at the time you're talking about, that it says. Here's one staunch guy. Absolutely. Okay. Um. What? What for you? We'll we'll, we'll get into um. Um. We'll we'll get into like like when he became an agent or, or or an informant. But but what for you is the difference between an informer and an agent? Because people, including myself, sometimes I'll kind of lazily, um, kind of use the terms interchangeably. You know. But 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 they're not quite the they're not quite the same term. Well, I think an agent is far more senior than an informer. An informer could be the wee guy on the corner, right? Whose who's eyes and ears, but he's not involved in the organization, right? Now, informers can also be involved in the organization, but they wouldn't be they wouldn't be in senior positions. Whereas an agent, by and large, is usually someone who's in a senior position within the movement and who can make and who can inform the British on major operations and stuff like that. Okay. Okay, I got you. Um, would would you say, for example, um, that like maybe like Robin Jackson was an agent as opposed to an informer? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I guess he wasn't an informer, but but would you classify him as an agent just to yeah. just to kind of test the definition? Absolutely. Jackson wasn't an informer. He was a British agent. He was actually a British assassin. But he was working hand in glove with the Glenarm gang. He was working hand in glove with the Glenarm gang, and and um, murder and Catholics. He was an agent. He informing wasn't wouldn't have been his thing. Right. Yeah. I I, I was going to say. I that. That. No, go No worries. No worries. Um. Okay. So a lot of this book um focuses on a group within the IRA um known as the ISU, the Internal Security Squad, or or the the Nutting Squad, more more commonly known. Can you give us, um, just for anyone who, who mightn't be familiar with the subject, can, can you give us an idea of, of just who they are, what, what they did, kind of to, to and from? Yeah. Uh, the IRA, up until 1977, the structure of the IRA had been basically uh, modelled on that of the British Army, in that you had a you had a brigade, battalion, and company structure in, in the big cities. And usually a battalion structure in, in the countries, in the country areas, and um, leading Republicans, Fred and Hughes, uh, Aver Bell, and Jerry Adams, came up with a different structure, which was an ASU structure, which was basically small units. Uh, the whole idea was that the security would be tighter, small. Hip Small units that would be a, a group of operators. Cells, yeah, the people call them cells. Cells, cell, cell structure, and the idea, but uh, running in parallel with that, there was a there was a feeling that you needed to have a, a more uh, comprehensive um, security basis, and for that to happen, for that to work, you needed to set up a, an independent unit. That whose sole purpose was to ensure the security of the ASUs and the movement in general, and they, they and, and hence we had the, the internal security unit set up. It was set up in 1878, and the first 
O, um, OC of it was a guy called Georgia McGee, who had been previously uh, a Marine, a Royal Marine, a uh, special boat service uh, soldier prior to the Troubles. And then he had joined the IRA when the Troubles started and had joined a company called D Company down in down the Lower Falls. And he um he was he was the first OC and Freddy Scapatici was his adjutant, that's his number two. And they picked they picked their guys, they picked the people of the unit, mostly friends from the old D company structure. And they and they then sat about finding informers, finding people who were getting British British information and once they if they cleaned it if they got them on tape admitting admitting their, their their that they were helping the British state, they shot them dead. That was their we met. And that 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 began in eighteen seventy eight. Okay, and, and they, they they were active uh, up until when? We were active right up until nineteen seventy four, right up until the ceasefire in nineteen or sorry in eighteen ninety four. They they were active the whole time. Um, for the ten years that Scapatichi was involved with the Northern Squad from nineteen seventy eight to, to nineteen eighty nine, there was thirty five people killed under his watch in one form or another. So that's that's what you're talking about here. That's what we know of. That's what we know of. Right, and and it's funny because um if if they had had their way completely, it's got teaching and his handlers, and um, we would all still think that those thirty five plus people were all informants. Um, but in reality, uh, not 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 so clear. Most definitely not. The bottom line of this was that this this internal security unit tortured, physically tortured, and psychologically tortured those whom they wished to break. You have to remember, these guys were measured by how many people they killed. That was a measure of their success. So they did everything in their power. And if you read the book, there's a there's a, a, a very telling indictment of them from a Republican called Paddy McDade, who was, who was whose treatment at the hands of them, you, you, you wouldn't have got you wouldn't have got in a, in a, in a South American banana republic. Uh, and he was, a, you know, he was just one. They tortured people into, into making confessions, and then they used the confessions as a means to justify their murder. And God knows how many of those people were absolutely innocent. You know, and we know that, for example, Michael Kearney was totally innocent. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and Seamus, yeah, sorry, Seamus had to live, and, and his family had to live for for years with the with the thought that that my own brother was was an informant until until he he was able to prove otherwise. But 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 Seamus's case is, is very much an exception in that he was able to to find evidence to to clear his brother. M m most people wouldn't wouldn't have that luxury at all. Well, there's Anthony Branoff as well from Ardoin. He was shot dead by them. And he got he got a, a, an apology from the IRA. But you're absolutely right. What for Big Shimmy's intelligence? What for his determination? His brother would still be seen as an informer. And it's it's a tribute to him that he was like a he was like a hound dog to get to the truth. And he kept at it and kept at it. And he, you know, he's a big friend of mine. And I, I think the word of him for it. Yeah, yeah, me, 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 and him. For for anyone who hasn't seen who hasn't seen our episode, we we spoke like in great detail. He um, he was able to uncover an internal document that his brother had wrote, which had gone missing. It had been fallen behind behind the fridge or something. And there was also he he also alluded to a list that uh, of uh, a list of names that Brendan Hughes wrote of uh, informers within within that squad, which he which he's since given to. His lawyer Kevin Winters, who who gave to Boucher in the in Canova. Uh, on that note, actually, um, it's very much. I think at this stage, it's very much accepted that it it was by no means just Scapatici 
um, who was who, who was a rat in that in that squad. It was it, it went way beyond him. Well, I'm always very careful. I have to I have to be sage. So I have to say, John, I'm always very careful about calling people informers. Principally because I'm not always certain that the evidence is, is strong enough to call them. Not that I don't think they're informers. I think that rat. I think that unit was absolutely rat infested. If I were to tell the truth, but I'm just I'm just not, and I say so in the book. I have to be careful. I can't work. I never seen this note from Brenton's. And even if I had seen it, I would have to say, where did Brenton get the proof? Do you understand me? As an author, I have to be I have to be certain that the evidence that I'm putting in, in the print is right. And I'm just not in the, I, I, I'm fairly confident that the dark put it in a down and right and it would be true. I have to be careful that I don't start calling people names that maybe at some future stage uh, would be would, would be seen to be erroneous. Of course, so much of this, so much of the the kind of dirty war, as it's called, it, it took place. It took place in the shadows. You know that uh, oftentimes there just isn't documentation or tangible evidence to to kind of prove this stuff i, I was speaking to um i was speaking to ann and ann cadwalder who, who wrote the lethal yeah. Act, and she she made the exact same point about collusion it's like like so often there won't be a stamped document that says i colluded with whoever or i informed and it, it just doesn't um so, so much of it yeah. exists in the shadows you know well i'm sure there's somewhere where there's a stamped document but it's an mi5 headquarters and they're not going to let the likes of me in to have a wee look at it. <laughs> you know, but but Anne's absolutely right. You, writers have to be careful that what they're putting down in print has a degree of backup. And I'm just not confident that the, the backup is, is, is sufficiently strong enough to, to put in print. Of course. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about there was this game that would go on um with like British handlers where they would treat they would treat their informers and their agents almost like like a chessboard, so to speak. You might have if you and me are both agents, and if I'm like a pawn, you know, I'm not that high up, but you're a you're a bishop, so to speak, it's very yeah. much trading me for you. Um there was there was this kind of there was this game that went on. Can, can you tell us a little a little bit about that? Like trading trading one high up informer for, for a not so a not so high up informer. Well that's a, that's a I have no proof of this, but that was a theory that has been knocking around for quite a way. Here's what you have to remember. This task in coordinating group that ran that that collated all the intelligence in relation to all the intelligence that came up from their from the ranks of their agents and their informers, it all came to them, and they didn't they didn't make decisions and hardly action it. Now, the people whom the Nutting Squad were supposed to be killing were all allegedly informers. So, if you take the alleged out and say they're all informers, then. They're actually agents of the British state. They're, they're working for the British state. And these, this, this, uh, this task and coordinating group, Scapatici, I have it from three very reputable sources that Scapatici told his handlers about every one of the people who were going to get killed. And those three people, that came from Canova, from the Canova report. So they, they send it up to the task and coordinating group. They're going to shoot Johnny 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 Jenkins. And they, Johnny Jenkins is one of our lads. The hell with him. He has to go. It's more important that we keep Freddie in place. It's more important that we keep someone else in place. Tough shit. Johnny knows his score. And Johnny was the book. Johnny may have been a fuck private, may have been a volunteer first. Right? Freddie's number one, that's maybe four odd. Freddie's number one in internal security. Freddie's fatting all new recruits before they even join the IRA or take the oath. They just know who they are. Freddie's debriefing everybody coming out of Castle Ray. So he knows about every operation that's been done. 
He knows who's on them. He knows what the, what type of guns has been on them. He knows where the gun was kept. He knows everything. What's more important, keeping Johnny in place, who might be on the odd operation or might be at the odd gun match or, or whatever, or keeping Freddie in place? Johnny has to go. And that's the way they thought. Everything was everything was thought out in terms of where's the benefit for us. And if, if their own people had to go, then so be it. Um, again, th th this is something that's very tough to prove, but um, you 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 spoke to people in the book who who have alleged it. But um, but how far up, uh, how far up is it safe to say the knowledge of steak knife and what he was doing went? Um, I I, I think there's some who suggested that that even up as 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 high as the prime minister. Well, it's it's again a speculation. It's difficult to say. Um, the Toskin and Coordinating Group knew about Freddie. MI5 knew about Freddie. MI6 would have known about Freddie. Whitehall would have known about Freddie. Freddie was important. He wasn't your ordinary common 5 8 right? right? He was an important guy. And his, his reports, reports on him and his activities would have been written out on a regular basis and they would have been sent to Whitehall. So you must. And, Thatcher knew what was going on. She knew that the Tosky and Coordinating Group were alert, that, that members of the, uh, the IRA and, for that matter, the UVF, etc., the loyalist groups who were in the employ of the government, who were types, right, were killing people out in operations. And she was told about this and she said, just don't get caught, right? That was her attitude to the whole thing. Just don't get caught. It doesn't matter. The end justifies the means. So I would say to that day that she was well aware of the name Freddie Scappaccici. On that note, um, obviously Scappaccici is by far the the biggest and most prolific um, informer or agent. Um, that we know of. Okay, yeah, exactly. That 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 was that was my question. Do you think it's fair to say that I'm sure there were others? Do you think it's fair to say that he was definitely the crown jewel? That he was that he was definitely the highest up, or um, could it possibly be that there were others? I, I'm sure there were others who who weren't quite as as valuable to them as Scapatici was. But 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 he, is there any possibility that they, that he wasn't he wasn't the number one? He was the crown jewel for the British Army. Freddie was ran by the Force Research Unit, right? Um, and he was their crown jewel. But I don't think Freddie was the highest uh, informer in the IRA. I think there's at least one guy higher than Freddie who was involved, who was privy to operations, etc., and he was feeding the British information. I see. Um, you you didn't. Um, this isn't you making any implication. I'm 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 not implying that you implied. But um, a lot of people, and it was discussed in the book. Um, th there are there are many who who would accuse um Martin McGuinness of um of working with British intelligence. There there was someone quoted in your book. Um, I believe it was I believe it was one of the authors of the original Steak Night book that he said um uh, Martin McGuinness wasn't with FRU. He was um he was with the uh, MI6. So, so within like like within the IRA, is it uh, is, is there like an average opinion in terms of whether McGuinness was informing in some way or, or wasn't? Well, the person who made the quote you're talking about is a guy called Ian Hurst. Ian was a former force reaction unit soldier, and he he'd been and he'd been uh, he'd been involved in there, and he's absolutely adamant that Martin McGuinness. Was an EMI six had, had been an EMI six agent from the early nineteen seventies in the IRA. Mm -hmm. Sorry, from the seventies even. Wow. Yes, from the nineteen seventies, EMI six, and and there had been the whole time. Um, in the IRA, there was a, no one wants to believe that Martin McGuinness is an informer. Right, it's almost too much to take, and. I don't want to believe it either. Uh, oh, it's the truth. Martin McInnes was a man who 
who seem to be very strong. But the more some of the things that he did, uh, and the Franco Haggerty killing, for example, it's absolutely inexplicable. And uh, it's difficult to not to look at that there and say there's something wrong here. But that's a long way from saying that he was an informer. I'm not too sure the evidence, there's enough evidence to say that Martin McGuinness was on the failure of the British. I know what Ian's saying. Ian, Ian, Ian Hurst is a very, very decent, in my view, he's a very soldier, former British soldier, very decent upright man who has no real, again, I don't see him having any, any agenda other than the truth. I'm just not sure that he's totally okay with everything, right? But um, yeah, I really don't want to believe that Martin McGinnis is, a, is, is an informer. That's even worse than Freddie Scapatici being an informer. Yeah, I really don't want to, yeah, I really don't want to say that he was one either. Nobody, uh, Jerry Adams has never never talked about this. None of them have ever said Freddie's an informer or nothing else. There's a secret deal that's been done, in my view, that fairly, fairly isn't to be touched. Really? As part of, like, like the Good Friday or something? No. Freddy, Freddy went down south on the run in 1989, January 1989, after the Sandy Lynch Sandy Lynch was an informer, was picked up by the IRA. The Brits hit the house and they rescued him. He was one of the ones they rescued. But... Freddie had to go on the run for two years. When he came back, he was shunned by the IRA. He wasn't allowed back into the nothing squad. And um, his, his, his behaviour was totally bizarre. But there were IRA people who believed, Spike Marie for one, that he was he was on his lark and he wasn't the former. And, um, you know, and he, he got a high ball, no even near him. Even when he was out it in two thousand and three in the press. Um he just he never he put never budged. I mean normally when that happens, the the, the guy grabs his furniture and clears off the and this guy didn't this guy said Poop said, I'm not. He said got the wrong scapatichi. There's about ten friendly scapatichis, you've got the wrong one, it's not me. Get the families together, I look them in the eye and I tell them. I never touched any of your sons or your daughters. Um, and, and that was, and he was for sticking it. He was for sticking it out. And he was under no pressure from, from the IRA. They weren't, they weren't saying a word about it. They were packing him up. In fact, they were saying that this was a, a secure crap flat to out this man to destroy his reputation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, it would stay that way, except of journalists. A, a, a lady journalist named called Sylvia Jones um, put on the internet uh, a tape in which Freddie was her a tape from 1983 in which Freddie was her for the Cooper yes that's it in which Freddie was her talking very loosely about the IRA and about Martin McGuinness and other people and that was him after that there was nowhere for him to go except get on the boat and get out um, p- people are... have, what for what for that tape? He the brass knacked it. He just said tape, and he just says not me. This is a bit of an understatement considering his whole career and the fact that he's, he stuck around after. But geez, what what a pair of balls on him! Um, I, I mean, my God, he had nerves of fucking steel. Like not not to you know not to give. I, I suppose to give credit where it's due. Not not that we'd be a fan of him or anything, but like, she's so. I mean, it did take balls, but he had it. But I'm certain, no, it's not as simple as that either. I'm quite certain that Freddie had a cost iron guarantee that no one in the, in the Republican movement was going to touch him. Right? And I'm not just as, I'm not just as certain, but I would be very surprised if Freddie didn't tell them and guys, I have an insurance policy. I've got you, you, and you, you, and you. Taped and videoed. He can put you all away for a long, long time. If it was a, if it was a her moved in my head, he's in trouble. 
and there are there are analyzes patterns because in, in the normal course of events, someone like him would have been shot dead like that. I was gonna say to um to have gotten he, he literally now got through three decades of the trouble. He 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 wasn't he wasn't an he, he wasn't an agent or an informer for the whole thing. But to uh, like like so many agents and so many informers have have met the same fate, which is which is a, a bullet in the back of the head, or if they're very very lucky, exile. But he he actually managed to play the game through to the very very end and came out apparently, um apparently with like like over a million, possibly two million uh, pound built up from all his uh from all his deeds, you know. Well, I reckon he got a million quid for for informant, and he was a wealthy man in his own right. He had tax schemes and all, tax fraud schemes and stuff. But he wasn't stuck for a few quid. And but going away to England was a bit of a a bit of a, a wrench for him. He, he originally went to a relative in Manchester, and then he got a he, he got a press embargo, a, a court and legal embargo that no one was allowed to photograph him, no one was allowed to say where he was living. And he literally disappeared off the radar for about 15 years. Uh, but he wasn't in good health. He had a couple of breakdowns. And um, I think he was very lonely. I, I mean, I get the impression, it's maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I always, when I think of Freddie in the later years, I think of Osama Bin Laden with an old blanket over his head. And the remote control, you know, that's that's the sort of image I have him. His wife would have visited him. His wife is a beautiful lady. I really, I mean, everyone I spoke to had nothing but the maximum praise for his wife. Says she was an absolutely beautiful, beautiful person. And she went, she went over to him every two weeks to keep him, to keep him company. But I, I, I had the impression that in between times. He's a very lonely guy, you know, and there's an irony in that, and that he had done all those things. He'd been involved in all those murders, and here he was, um, coming towards the last decade or so of his life, living wherever he was living, hiding, looking over his shoulder, right, worried, who's going to spot me, because. By that stage, he was, he was infamous, and he, he doesn't know if he's walking up the street or somebody on the other side of it, or it's from Belfast and going to recognize him or whatever. But um, but I always, I, I, certain irony and having all that money and being absolutely miserable and, and alone, I could be wrong, but that's, that, that's the impression I have of him. Sure. What what one of the things the books did that um that I'd never read in in any other book about him or, or referencing him was um yeah we 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 did get into like like him as a man his his kind of his personality um at times what one of them you you kind of alluded to it there where he he had um he had like very much like depressive um episodes in his months or, or in his in his years like like months at a time there was even um um. Uh, there was even some information about like like his kind of pornography habit, even even back even back during the troubles when it was all like like video like actual you needed like a physical video. Um, there was uh, apparently he had a big he had a big old collection, and then more recently he was even convicted of having um like like images of of, of bestiality on, on his computer. Well, he was that was in two thousand and seventeen, and um. Actually, it was the Canova team uh, who raided his house and they looked at his computers and stuff and they found uh, the, the 314 images of video, 314 video tapes, right? All of bestiality and pretty horrific stuff. But I've never seen the tapes, but I've seen the, I have the copy of the, the chart sheet and money was involved in. And it was bloody horrendous. And I think it was. But anyway, um, he tried to say that he had no interest in bestiality. He just, you know, it's typical Freddy. Don't, don't admit nothing. Right? He went to his death, never admitting that he was a spy, that he was a, an agent. Admitted nothing. 
And that was the CRE training. CRE training was when you're arrested, you pick a spot on the wall and you keep looking at that spot and you don't talk. Right? And that was that was his IRA trailer. And that's he did that to the very end. And he never ever admitted being on a, a, a tight or whatever you want to call it. And that, that was him. And, and well, in, in terms of the bestiality thing, he tried to say he was just looking at us, just looking at it. And what am I? I'm interested in girls with big breasts. And the cop says, Well, there's no images of girls and big breasts on your computer, it's all animals. And it's again and again it's repeated. He couldn't he couldn't get away. He couldn't get away. He got he got a, a minor thing and that was it. But it was it's he wasn't boy, he was a porn freak from an early age. He was in the cupboard full of porn. Um okay. Uh, S- uh, switching um s- sw- switching topics a bit um okay so to to play to play devil's advocate maybe just to make it interesting um so I'm I'm sure there would be some people who would say like look Crimea River over what Scapatici did because most of the people he killed whether they were um labeled informants or not they were still IRA members and look you live by the sword and you die by the sword and you knew what you signed up for and look you you signed up for a game where you can get killed and you got killed. I not not personally, not a view that I hold, but but some would say that what what would you say to someone who would say, look, it's not even that big of a deal. It was just it was just kind of terrorists killing other terrorists. Well that's the British Army's approach. That was a that was the the what the MI five man said to to uh Keely. Keely was a guy from Uri who was an ex British soldier who infiltrated the Mutton Squad. And that's what they said to him. Well, who cares if it's only really IRA people killing the IRA people? And, and, and people can have that attitude. See, at the end of the day, a lot of these guys who were killed, um, were not bad people. They didn't deserve to die. You know, none of them deserve to die. And none of them deserve to be tortured. Right? There's a human rights issue here that supersedes everything. The IRA and, and rightly so has always been uh, very strong on human rights abuses and related to in relation to their own volunteers. And here they were practicing massive human rights abuses on people whom they hoped they thought made have been informers. And they mightn't have been informers. They mightn't even have been in the IRA. How come they weren't in the IRA? Did those people deserve to be killed? I don't think so. And I think that this devil may cry, they're all, they're all, they're all IRA people. Doesn't doesn't stand up. I, I was gonna say as well, if you're if you're the British Army or some uh, some member of British government, you're supposed to you're very much supposed to be like above these sort of paramilitary guerrillas who aren't paid by taxpayer, who 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 aren't trained and who aren't working for government, you're you're not supposed to engage in um in illegal war uh, practices like like a group like the IRA can. You know, you're you're supposed to be or go, you're you're supposed to be working for the government. You're you're supposed to be above that. You know. Well, these guys, this task getting coordinating group, I keep coming back to them because they are so crucial to all of this. They they. The IRA Army Council, in fact, thought they controlled this situation. That when someone was broken or someone made a statement admitting a member admitting that they were working for the British, an army an army council member would have came and passed in that the sentence of death on them, and they would have been taken out and shot there. But above that army council, there was another army council. They were the real army council, and that's this task and coordinating group. It was they who said who lived and who died, not these guys. These guys thought that they did. It was these guys here who really did. And the first and, and these guys would have told you, and they were they were, they were cops. They were they were MI5, they were British soldiers the, whose primary object was the was the preservation of law and order. First principle of policing is the preservation of life. And they were going out of the way to ensure that people were murdered. And they either than a battered and murder. They either than a battered Michael Kearney's murder. They either than a battered and Anthony 
Ronald's murder. And God knows how many other innocent victims. But even if there weren't innocent, these guys aided and abetted in murder. I, I was going to say, okay, so there were the there were the IRA members that they that they killed when 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 they they didn't have to when when they shouldn't have. There's also there's a lot more clear um, there's a lot more clear examples like like for example um, it's it's strongly suggested that that they may have known that one of their um, one of their informants named Joe Fenton was about to get killed. They they might have had um they might have had bugs and recording that would that would tell their handlers that, but they let Fenton go on um and be killed. There's also the um there's also the the Mahan family. Could, could you tell us a bit about them? Because this is um this isn't exactly like like an IRA active service member being being stitched up. This is someone who 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 wasn't involved anywhere near that degree. These were two. These this is a husband and wife. They were what. Was, was termed at the time 10 pound touch, right? They weren't a heavy whip. They were, they were, yes, if they seen something, they'd have phoned it in, right? But that's all they would have done. They weren't involved in the IRA. They weren't, they weren't even particularly involved to have IRA sympathies. But Joe Fenton was, Joe Fenton was a, was a strange case. Joe was caught with explosives and brought into the cop shop. The cops, the bicycle branch said to him, you have two choices, either you work for us and we let you go on and deliver the explosives to you to go to and nobody will be any the way or, or you don't work for us, in which case we charge you and you'll get 15 years in jail. So he took the, he took the, the first option, right? I worked for you, but he didn't want to work for them. And he got his family together and they went to the Australian embassy and they applied as a family to move to Australia to live. And Joe had a clean record, and they were going to let him go. Students were, were, were going to let him come in. And then the branch stepped into the, stepped into the thing and said to the students, this guy's a terrorist. You can't let him in. So they didn't let him in. Joe came back. He was in Northern Ireland, right? And he was straight back, and they had him back working for them, right? And they wouldn't let the guy go. Okay, it was very well. I mean, again, blackmail, Solby's blackmail. Black Mill did the work in front of him and she's working away for him and the heat's coming on and somehow or another he finds out about the Mackins. So he directs the IRA to the Mackins and they're shot dead. Right? And Joe Singh is a, is a bit of a wonderful guy because he, he was able to help out in this way. This is all healthy. And then Brendan Cuse was very the dark, was very suspicious of him. And he's eventually picked up. Brendan was the director of intelligence for the whole IRA. G, GHQ director of intelligence, he's on the Army Council as well. And the dark uh, was very suspicious of him. Joe's picked up, picked up by Freddy. Freddy's very heavily involved in his interrogation. Freddy's phoning the Sanders. This guy's going to get whacked here. If you don't call me, I'll tell him you're not, he's going to get whacked. And then somewhere in the lane, it's a realization that, no, he's not getting whacked, he's going to get taken down south. Right? And they're going to debrief him proper, and he knows everything. He he, he was an important um, agent, as he was involved with the OC of Belfast. And the OC of Belfast um, wasn't an agent, but he was naive. Right? And he was backing this guy up, Joe, and Joe broke, and Joe told some some stuff. But the idea was, rather than take him down south anyway, a debrief and find out everything that he knows. And on the way out the door, he was shot dead. Somebody said he tried to make a run for it, right? Another guy says, no, he wasn't. The guy just pulled out the shooter and shot him. Pulled the gun out and shot him. And... And um, so there was a hue and cry. Why was he shot? The dark was going to the out. Why was this man shot? I wanted them down south. I needed the question. And there was a suspicion that he was shot to make sure that he didn't get down south, but he knew too much. So that's that's the Joe Fanton story. But at the back of it all, was a very frightened guy who didn't want to be doing what he was doing and who could blackmail the new place by branch. 
And at the back of all of that, you had the task and coordinating group. He knew what house he was in, who could have intervened and saved his life, but didn't. You um you alluded to something very true there um that uh like a lot of a lot of people are turned in form and th- it, it, it's not even as if they have some desire to fucking, to to work with the British government or anything they just get um uh, uh, often uh, oftentimes you're you're dealing with working class people who you know who aren't aren't rolling in money so if you can uh if you can blackmail them in some way or if you if you can even blackmail them and then pay them like a little bit a, a small bit of money could, could go a long way now this very much wasn't the case or it, it's it's certainly believed it wasn't the case with scapatici he was um um i think it's uh i think it's believed and it, it was uh, at least in his in the the first steak knife book was that he was a walk-in c- c- can you tell us a bit about how how steak knife uh, came to be an informant and how how, how much we even know about it well, that's one of the big conundrums. Um, there's about six or seven different theories as to how he, he ended up um, an agent. One is that he was a walk and I don't believe for one second that he was a walk not for a second. Perry was ideologically committed Republican. Certainly he was up until he was released from retirement. And I can't see him. I can't see, the, I can't see him changing that much. I don't think he was a walking. I don't think he was he was talked that he was involved in a fight and he walked in and, and offered the service to the British. But fight with two Iranian and offered the service to the British to come back up him. I don't think that's the case. There are two possibilities, as I said. One is that he was going to get serious pain for the tax scam that he'd been involved in for years. Right? He could have got up the eight years there because other people were getting eight years, right? And he's only he's only after he's only after doing the, uh, quite a long stretch for internment for someone who was never charged. He's done three and a half years or something. Never charged with anything. So uh, the possibility of doing an eight stretch may have exercised him to say the least. The other possibility was that he was done, and this is a rumor, but it's a rumor only. There's a rumour that he was arrested and charged the common sex with an underage person. Now, that is rumour. And again, there's nothing, there's no evidence whatsoever to back it up. But were that to be the case, that would be a very credible uh, reason for him to turn. Whatever turned Freddy, it was something that materially injured him personally, right? It would have been blackmail. It would have been something that was so horrendous that he believed to be so horrendous, the alternative was to work for the Brits. That's that's the way I see it. Um interesting. Yeah, I I, I did um that, that that did that did shock me when I when I saw the allegation in the book that he had um um I, I, I think I can't remember the exact quote, but someone even said that they were like they were passing in the car and he'd be making comments about like like teenage girls and stuff, kind of unsettling stuff, you know? Well, that that's only one thing. There's other stuff that you didn't put in, simply because uh, there's no evidence of it at all. The one that you're talking about, there's a bit of evidence for it, so that's why I put it in. But even at that, that is not hard and fast to say that he had a sexual sort of deviance in terms of underage kids. I'm just mentioning that it has been said to me that he had a preference for underage girls. We 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 sort of touched on it earlier, but um, once once you get um accused of being an informant and get like arrested and questioned, a lot of them are stuck in a really tricky situation where like they know they're gonna get tortured until they say something. So like if you, geez, if you if you torture someone long enough, they tell you they shot Michael Collins. Like you, you know what well, I mean? Well, that's right. Don't tell you anything. Someone's tortured to the point where they're ready to break. They will say that you want them to say, and if you want them to say you were you were involved in a song, why should you give the top ten years? You said. I mean, the, 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 my, the torture of Paddy my did. I mean, it was horrendous. I mean, that guy was me. That guy was forced to urinate. Defecate and say a, a sleeping bag for three days, and used as an ice tray 
stood all over his face, stood all over his hands, lifted him above their heads, slapped him on a concrete floor. Heavy stuff. Like the stuff you'd see the Nazis then. That's in the area of the Nazis. These places are the control. This wasn't typical of the IRA. These places are a lot under themselves. Um, was there some, um, obviously it's, it's quite a project to put together this book. It must have, God knows how many headaches and late nights and, and frustration oh. and, and, and so on. But um, in terms of your motivation for it, like, is any part of you, given that you were a member and that there was such such a prominent reform, was there any part of you that kind of has like an itch that you needed to scratch with uh, with getting to the bottom of Scap teaching and at least making it public about him? Well, there was. I, I mean, I have always thought that Scapatici was barely scratched. The surface of the Scapatici story had been barely uh, touched, and that um, there was real dirty dealings going on. And I have always a suspicion. I always here's the thing. Here's what motivated me more than anything. Scapatici was a British agent. Right? And I and I suspect my boy always suspect that somebody said to me, How do you know he always passed the names and stuff up the stairs? And I and my answer to this, this was an earlier interview last week. There's no way what the Brits say you can pick and choose what information you want to give us. Right? No intelligence agency would allow that. Right? Stadium. You tell us everything, boy. Oh, don't you even think of hiding anything from us, right? So he told his handlers everything. And out of all of this Capatici right, right from, from he was exposed in 2003, right up and virtually until my book, this task in a coordinating group have been hiding in full view. And nobody's ever heard of him. He asked the leading journalist last week. Lady John last night says, What about the task in the coordinating group? And she says, Who are they? I didn't <laughs> I didn't know before reading your book, and, and I consider myself more knowledgeable than, than most, yeah. Ah, and these guys are hiding hiding the place on TV. They're on TV giving analysis, giving opinions on this and that and the other. And these are the boys that sat there on the Monday morning smoking or whatever they're doing and said, Let him go, let him go. He's gonna get shot there. Oh, well, I have, a, I have a snooker match over in the club or whatever. That was part of the principal reason why, one of the big principal reasons why I thought this book needed to be written. One of the, the, the there was there was another another kind of allegation you addressed in your book, and again it was something that I read in the the Ingram Harkin steak knife book. Um, th this isn't about steak knife, but 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 more the FRU. Th they said that um. That the FRU at one stage actually might have saved Jerry Adams's life, and what they said they what they said happened was that they found out uh, on an attempt that was going to be made on his life, and then they found out where the guns um, were found, or, or the, the the guns were hid. Rather, they went and uh, fiddled around with them to to reduce the to reduce like the, the capacity of it, um, and then which possibly may have saved his life, considering he did get shot, um, not, not to the head. Um, but uh, into the body and that, um, and you know, it, 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 he might have been saved by the fact that his gun was was jerked, as they say. Do, do you do you personally believe that? I don't know. I don't know. In the book, they say, I mean, whether or not the, there was full, the 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 rounds had a full, uh, uh, were fully loaded with with the P P E T. I don't think you call it. That's the stuff that makes the bullet fire. It's, it's like explosives. You can't even of it. Whether I was full of that or whether I was only half. One of the bullets had a hit Jerry Adams in the head. He may have been dead. I mean, it was pretty risky business to say, we'll only put half of it in and hopefully he won't be hit in the head. I, I just, it's, it's something that, I mean, oops, things are capable of running. I, mean, I just, you know, they live in, they live in this dark world, and I, I don't know. It just seems a bit far fetched to me. Yeah, it, I, it, I could be wrong. 
it, it definitely stood out in my mind because of the just the bizarreness of it. Like, yeah, and, and the fact it, it illustrates um, a, an interesting position that handlers would be in. Um, and you and you 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 actually you you alluded to it in the book. Um, there was a, a movie called The Imitation Game, and there's a yeah. the part when they they crack the code, and then they realize that they're in a position where they can't go saving everyone. Um, that they find out through through their their cracking of the code, because if they do, it'll just be so obvious. Um, and and the the British handlers were 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 playing the same game. In eighteen seven in eighteen eighty six, an order came from the Army Council. So there's a few IRA operations that were very bad. People were getting hurt, the civilians, etc. And uh, the Army Council decided all all operations had to be vetted by the OC Northern Command. He was Martin McGuinness. So rather, I mean, I mean that's that's a big task. So we delegated the Belfast uh, batting to the Northern Squad. The OC of whom, of which, was very strategic. <laughs> so, in actual fact, the British Army, the Tuscan Coordinating Group, had the rate of veto in Belfast over operations. Which meant all IRA operations had to go through the British Army. <laughs> Crazy. Mad altogether. Yeah, I, I actually didn't know that until reading the book that um the ISU had uh, had like like you said veto power over over operations. I, I I didn't know they were quite that powerful. Well, they were. They fairly as I keep saying, fairly was highly respected, right? And it was Martin McInnes had given the nod anyway to say it's going through the ISU, and he was controlling, which meant that the bits were controlling all apps. Um, I'll I'll leave it I'll leave it to people to read the book to actually get his whole um his whole kind of story e- excellently done like, like I said um but but one of the one one of the fascinating parts of it was when it was towards the end of his time in the IRA he hadn't been he wasn't like out um completely or officially but he was kind of being um being ostracized he was being marginalized somewhat within the movement and um there's a quote from a, a criminologist. Who who says that when when people who p- people like him who kind of lose power and um, they they'll often start like flailing they'll they'll throw like a bit of a temper tantrum in, in an attempt to I don't know maybe to strike back or get a bit of power back and um, he you you you, uh, you mentioned it briefly but, but he spoke to um he spoke to a television show which was out at the time called the Cook Report um can, can you tell us a bit about that the the timing of it's very interesting that he decided to to kind of kick out a, a, around that time. This was after he came back in 1981, and he was in charge with the Sandy Lynch affair, which was inexplicable because he, he had a finger, his, his fingerprint was found on the battery of the security buzzer they used to see if a, 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 a suspect was carrying a bug. His, his fingerprint was caught on uh, inside, inside the device. That was used to, 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 to buzz them down. It was caught in the room where Sandy Nice was held. So that put Freddy right in the room. And there's a whole ring the rule, and he came up with this bizarre story that he, he was doing work for a lady who lived in the very house that on which Lynch was held. He'd been doing electrical work on it. Madness, pardon me for question. How he got, well, we know how he got away. They put up his madness. And also, Sandy Lynch said he knew Scapatici's voice. And the guy who owned the house made a statement to the police saying that Scapatici had been the leading guy. So well, he got out and he wasn't dark roomed. But we said to him, really, how did you get out in the face of such strong evidence? But he got out anyway. But he was out of the IRA, to my knowledge. And he was ostracized, ostracized in the sense that he was no longer. Uh, furnished with the, with the information that he had been used to. He was outside the circle, right? He wasn't being told what the Northern Squad was up to, who the new recruits were. He wasn't that nanny one coming out of the out of the out of the castle way, out of, out of the barracks, etc. He was isolated. And for a guy like this who had been very regimented all his life, it, this guy liked to work. He used to go to work in the mornings. 
the silos workers to work and he he's done a bit of he's a bricklayer, he's done a bit of bricking himself. He'd had his day ordered every one of the day would have been he didn't know he didn't know where he was and maybe he usually done his IRA stuff. All of a sudden he's out of the loop. He doesn't know what's happening. He's not knocking around really, really not knocking around the IRA people. And he starts behaving bizarrely. He asked, as you said, he asked to see the GOC, a guy called General Wilsley. And Wilsley, and he asked for an assurance that he's still important, that he's still, he's still as important now as he was before some events. He wants this, you're the jewel in the crown. He wasn't the jewel in the crown by then because he didn't have the information, didn't have access to the information that he wants had. So after that there, he, he goes to a guy, he, he will, after that, there he, he makes his he goes to the Cook Report. The Cook Report run a two week series on Martin McGinnis. Say he was the most, he was the biggest terrorist in Ireland, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. McGinnis didn't cooperate, of course. But when he watched it, I mean, at the end of the second series, he phoned him up in Manchester, the Granada TV, and says, What at McGinnis stuff you put on his own balls? Man says, Who are you? He says, Look, I'm someone who knows about these things. So there he convinces them that he's a real McCoy. He meets him in the Culloden Hotel that night. This is in 1993. He meets a, he, he meets a guy called Dan Twistle. He meets uh, Sylvia Jones and another guy. And they put the tapes on and he tells them about Martin McGuinness, that Martin McGuinness is the guy who gives them the rod for all the Milton Squad killings. And he talks about the English department. Well, that is, that is pretty... Uh, that, that he's an area no one wouldn't talk about, something like that. And it's very loose and it's very, very bad. So he tells them all that. And then after that, there are about a year, maybe six months later, he goes to, uh, not too quickly there. In the meantime, the branch found out that Freddie's in the car park talking to this, these reporters. They grab one of the reporters, Sophia Jones, and they say, he is far too important. You can't publish this because he'd be dead by the weekend. Right? And the other people dead as well. So they, they, they agree to hold back on it. But she takes it, she, she has the recording. And then Freddie goes to the, the, a member of a, a father whose son was shot dead and tells him, I was there when your son was shot. If he had to chat him, chat him in the neck. And I told him to shoot him in the head, and he said, well, put the lot out of his misery, as if he's doing a great favour. This is all very bizarre behaviour, right? I only stress as much. This isn't the very scrap of teaching for you, Sandy Lynch. He's never got up the hot list stuff. And that hence my view that he was off the rails. He didn't, he wasn't thinking things out. He was Trying to actually a room for himself, maybe trying to maybe trying to ingratiate himself with the IRA again, who don't seem to have any, had any interest on him, but he, he seemed to be off the rails. And the really interesting thing is, is that Sylvia Jones, the girl who had the, who recorded him, was the one who finally broke him. She broke him. She was the one in 1984 who released the tip and there was no escaping. There was no more there was no more bullshit on Freddy Jew. And then that's when he that's when he, he, he took off. Right. Right, yeah, it, it it was a very interesting um piece of information. It, it was kind of an insight into him, yeah. This this tantrum he threw after he wasn't so important anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well the the, the analyst was able to the the work all that out. Um, I, I I won't keep you I won't keep you too much longer. Um, uh, obviously obviously Freddie Scappatici um uh, died um not too long ago. And there's some who would say I was gonna say um there's some who would say oh yeah we we haven't seen the body we we don't really know. Uh, your your own personal view is he uh is he no longer with us? Uh, I don't think he's got this anymore. I think he is there. I knew that he was in Bar House. He was living in uh Guildford. Uh, in 2017, and uh, he had a massive heart attack then, 
and he's been in bad health for the last ever since he left the north. Ever, ever, ever since he went away, he'd been having uh, he'd been in bad health, he'd been having strokes, etc. So he, he, when I say that I have this image of him with Bin Laden with the blanket over the head in the remote, that's the image that I have of him. I, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, he, he'd been in bad health, so I wouldn't be at all surprised if he is dead. Same time, I wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't dead. But he was there on Bondi Beach with a, with a cool posters. Wouldn't surprise me either. <laughs> I, I was going to say, if I was more, if I was more conspiratorial minded, I would say, wow, this is great timing that he's a uh, that he died just before Canova. Isn't that a uh, isn't that funny? No, uh, I, I don't. I don't think that. I think he he is perfectly reasonable age. How do we know? He, how do we know he wasn't given a Mickey Finn? How do we know somebody didn't put something in his tea? And give him a wee push along the way. When Freddy died, Canova collapsed. Any chance of convictions collapsed? Interesting. Interesting. I, I was going to ask it that as my final question. Any um, Canova has been. Uh, I, I I think it's been put put back. Uh, its release has been put back quite a quite a number of times. And the book um the book goes goes into detail about it. But but what do you um what do you expect when we do soon eventually get? I mean we're recording this on September twenty fifth, so I mean it shouldn't be too long. What 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 are you expecting from it? Three weeks. The reckon that Canova will be out in three weeks. There's different reports. I have heard a report from a guy who said that he read it. And this guy, this guy said that it's very, very critical of the security services. Right? So I'm anticipating that it will say what I said. It said in the book that Scapatici told the security services about every killing and that he was involved. And by and large, they sat by and let those killings occur. So they hid it in the, battle, in the murder of British Irish citizens. That's what I think and I was gonna say. Do you expect them? Um, I, I I was um I I was talking about this with, with Seamus kind of briefly um and we both kind of came to a similar ish although he was to be honest he, he he was saying he was saying he does have some optimism and he, he was saying he hopes that Boucher um treats this I, I, I believe the way he said it was uh, I hope he treats this as a vocation not just like a nine to five job, uh, you know that he treats it like a proper, a proper investigation. I personally don't think I'd be shocked if anything was in it that would actually lead to um kind of concrete actions being taken or someone having to be convicted or so on. W w would you agree? Do, do, do you think, yeah, in, my, I, in my opinion, it won't get released if it actually have, put someone in it? I have been saying for for from my start of this book that. This legacy bill has more to do with the potential for charges in the future than it has in the past. This, the legacy bill, in my view, was never about some wee farmer getting shot in the back 15 years ago. The legacy bill for me was about the, the TCGs, about the, the, the potential that these guys would be hauled before the courts and charged with murder type offences, i.e., even in the batting murder. Or, or 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 facilitating murder, or whatever, right? My view always, my view was was that this was about saving them, and it's and, and, you, and you touched on it. Freddie Scapatici dies in April this year, right? And when he dies, there was 19 friends sent to the public prosecution uh, service, and Miss Freddie Scapatici uh, and Miss Freddie Scapatici was accused of murder. Of one in, in one form or another. Those phase were nine null and void because he's no longer there to be the them. Right? If Felix Capatici had it been called before court, he made it give evidence, he probably wouldn't have, but he made her. That isn't gonna happen either. So what what are we left with? Right? All that we're left with is the trail that Big Shimmy talked about, the Mazer trail. Right, and the, and the good thing about it was is that Boucher was able to access MI5 feds. And if nothing else comes out of, of Boucher, other than the fact that Scapatici told his honours about every 
Kelly, then that's a major that's a major victory because then we know that the British state they already admitted these killings. It's not as if you're willing to prove against them. They probably posted to the shot these guys, right? But the other end of it is if if this goes if if it's proven that this trail well it started with Freddy Freddy's got the teach you to a stand there to his to his boss and his right up to his task and coordinating group that these guys knew thirty five times at least beforehand that someone was going to be murdered and that these guys could have sent in the troops to save the the, the, the suspect suspect's life and didn't do it. Then we're into a new realm. And the possibilities that that opens up. I, 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 I was actually talking to a lawyer the other night, and, and it could be a bloodbath. I mean, not a bloodbath in terms of real blood, but where, where this, is, this, isn't, this isn't over. It's not going to be over with Canova. I mean, if, you, if you're a family member and you know that uh, the forces of law and order could have saved your son and didn't, you're going to want to know why didn't you? And why is this man not being charged? This is a process. It could be a bloodbath. Yeah, I, I, I hope. Look, I, I, I really do hope that that um, like the handlers and and the the higher ups in question, I don't know, at least get, at least get kind of named and shamed, um, if not prosecuted. But I, I, I think I think it'd be fair to say, like, are, are we long past the? The time when when anyone will actually be like prosecuted. Let let's say like let's say they actually got like like st steak knife handlers. W would I be right in saying like it's probably way past the point where they'd be actually uh, convicted or something? I don't know. The legacy bill is going to negate all of that. I think um, the best that could probably happen was to take civil cases against the Ministry of Defence, the relatives, but in a civil case. Everything comes out anyway. It's as, it's as good as an open court. All evidence has to be presented. So I think that would probably be the way the lawyers will go. Th thank you very much now for all your time. Um, oh, very you're much, welcome. Very much appreciated. I was going to say, anyone now, if you if you're if you're familiar with the with Northern Ireland's history and the troubles, it's an excellent book to read. If you haven't read a single thing about it. And then it's also it's also a good place to start because the book gives you a bit of context. The book just isn't specifically about this one thing. It, it is mainly, but but it does give you a a wider context. Um, on that note, is there anything uh, anything you want to leave us with there? Any any final thoughts? No, well, John. Just uh, thank you so much. Um, very informative, and you're well tuned in. I'm very very happy with this interview. Thank you very much. My my pleasure. Um, we we might even um we might even speak again. Um, after Canova comes out or, or more, more information comes out in the future. Absolutely. But Canova's going to be huge. So if you need me, give me a shout.